Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today we're continuing our series where I've been playing a teaching that I did in Phoenix, Arizona, January of 2012. And I've got these products. The end of this week is going to be the end of us offering this teaching, Don't Limit God Times Ten. And you know the title is not the catchiest title. There's some people that won't get this. But I tell you, this is one of the most important things that ever happened in my life. And I believe that most of us are in a very similar situation that I was back in 2002 when God spoke this to me. So I think that this teaching uh, could really impact your life. Let me also say right before we get it back into that video that I want to uh, mention that this is the anniversary of the September the 11th attacks on America. And you know, there's been a lot of change in America since then. And not all of it's for good. I remember right after those attacks that, man, the patriotism that people were dropping things and that we were united. It's like we were under attack and sometimes like a family, they will criticize each other. But if somebody from the outside comes against them, boy, they close ranks and stand with each other. And one of the things that I saw was that the churches filled up. People were uncertain and they recognized that, you know, they didn't know what this was going to lead to, whether it was all out war. And in situations like that, when we come to the end of ourselves, people turn to God and they look to God for help and comfort and direction. And here we are all of these years later. And did you know our situation really has not improved? Some people might think, well, we haven't gone to a world war or whatever, but I don't think anybody would say that we're safer today than we were back in 2001 when those attacks came. I tell you, we are in a precarious situation and I just want to remind you, if you go back and remember how you felt the uncertainty and some of you begin to start praying more than you had, you went to church, we need that just as much as we ever did. Maybe we don't have a national crisis hanging over our head the way we did back then, but I guarantee you, each one of us personally need to depend upon God for every single thing in our life. So I'd just like to encourage you on the anniversary of this to remember that and to once again, submit yourself, seek God, yield yourself. Don't lean under your own understanding, but instead, instead seek God. And if you'll do that, it'll transform your life. So we're going to go back into this teaching where I was talking about don't limit God. So this is something God spoke to me January the 31st, 2002. And since then, it has revolutionized me in the ministry and made a a big, big difference. And I believe that every one of us limits what God can do in our life. We talked about we limit God because of ignorance, which comes primarily by us comparing ourselves with each other and just looking at kind of average and thinking we want to be an average person. God made all of us for something special. And so our ignorance of God's will for us limits what He can do in our life. And we need to quit comparing ourselves with other people. We need to uh, change our lifestyle because Mark 4, 19 talks about that the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches and lust of other things will choke the word of God. And so we've got to get to where we aren't busy. Psalms 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. And it's gonna take some seeking of the Lord and spending time with the Lord in order to begin to start getting his direction and taking the limits off of God. So we talked about that. Last night I started talking about fear limits God. And we talked about a fear of change, a fear of the unknown, and a fear of failure. And we let these kind of fears paralyze us. And I used last night, I thought some powerful examples of those four lepers who were going to die if something didn't happen. And finally they got smart enough to say, how long are we going to sit here till we die? Let's get up and do something. The worst that could happen to us is we die. And I tell you what, I think that is great wisdom. And there are people who are paralyzed from doing things and stepping out and following the direction of the Lord because they're afraid they're going to fail. Man, so what if you fail? It's not that big of a deal. Amen. Every person I've ever read about who is a great success also had great failures. 
You know, Babe Ruth was, was one of the greatest uh, baseball players and stuff, but he struck out more. He also set all of the records for striking out and he would swing so hard, he would fall on the ground. He looked crazy, but he also set records. And it's a myth to think that you can just do everything perfectly. And if you are such a perfectionist that you just think you have to do it all perfectly, you're never going to get anything done. You need to get over being afraid of failure. This morning we talked about a fear of man or persecution, what people are going to say. And the fear of man brings a snare. And I tell you, there's so many people that they have become codependent upon the approval of a mate of family, friends, relative, church people. They just can't handle somebody criticizing them. And if you are the type of person that criticism just eats your lunch, well, then you are going to limit God. I can promise you, you will not accomplish what God wants you to do. If you become a godly leader, Satan is going to see to it that there's criticism and rejection of you. All those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. If you aren't suffering persecution, it's because you aren't living godly. If you live godly, you will be persecuted. You will have people come against you. And if you are so bothered by people's rejection that it's going to keep you from saying or doing what God told you to do, you will limit God. So we talked about that. And then I also talked about a fear of success. With me, I've seen, I believe more people are destroyed by success than they are by adversity and hardship. Pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, 18 says that. And more people have been destroyed during times of prosperity than they ever have during times of adversity. If you go into church history, did you know that every time the church is persecuted, it flourishes? Every time the church is in a relative uh, period of prosperity, it always goes into apostasy. And I believe that that's what we're seeing happen in this nation. Our nation has gotten to where it's just religious. It was started in Christian principles, but now the church is having minimal impact in our nation in a lot of ways. And I take no joy in saying this, but this is a post-Christian nation in many ways. Now, I'm not accepting that and I'm not... Uh, you know, dooming us to that. I'm saying that I believe that God can still resurrect it and I'm doing everything I can to preach the word and to stand up. And I still am hopeful and believing God for this nation. But I'm just saying that if you are paying attention, you can see that the prosperity of this nation has caused many people's hearts to wax, their love to wax cold. And uh, it happens. And so anyway, those are the things we've already talked about and all these things limit God. What I want to talk about tonight is the subject that if I had a week to teach on this, I couldn't cover all of the things that God has shown me. So this is going to be a lot of information. And based on my interaction with people, this is a lot of stuff that most people haven't thought of. So this is going to be relatively new to you. And, uh, Lots of times when people are presented with a lot of new stuff all at once, they just basically will not accept it. It's like that's too much to accept. So uh, anyway, I just encourage you before I start sharing, not to throw this out until you give it a chance. Meditate on it. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And if you understand it, this could revolutionize your life. And I'm going to talk about the power of imagination. And I'm also going to make a connection and show you that I believe what the scripture is calling imagination is your hope and how powerful this is in taking the limits off of God. First of all, let me just define some things. Imagination, according to the dictionary, means your ability to see something that is not real or present. That's what the dictionary defines imagination as your ability to see something that is not real or present. For instance, if I was to ask you how many uh, doors you have in your home, most of you have never sat down and counted the number of doors in your home. You don't have this piece of information just filed away. And yet every person in this place could tell me how many doors you have in your home. You know how you do it? You'd look at it. You have an image of the place you live in, in your mind. 
That's your imagination. And you could tell, you could sit there and count the number of doors in your home. Many of you are doing that right now. <laughs> Some of you might say, well, I've only got one or two doors. It's easy to count. Well, let's say this. How many windows do you have in your home? Did you know you could do the same thing? You could go through every room in your house and count the windows. And yet you aren't seeing it with your eyes. You're seeing it in your imagination. God created us with an imagination and you can't think without an imagination. An imagination is essential. If I was to ask you, how do you get from here to the airport? Did you know none of you are sitting here and with your physical eyes seeing things, but you would say, well, let's see, you go out here and you go to this first traffic. So you'd tell me how to get out the baseline road and then you'd tell me, well, you turn right at that light. How do you know it's right? Because you're looking at it. And then you'd say you go up here and if you, you turn left on the interstate 10 and you go up and it's exit so-and-so and it'll be signpost and you're seeing this stuff. If you had never seen it, like for instance, to get from our office down to the interstate, I tell people that let's see, you go, there's three lights, there's four if you count the fire station that is a uh, sometimes, you know, what do you call that? A temporary or emergency light, but there's four lights and I'm counting them. And I say, you go down to the fourth right and you take a right and do stuff. You know what that is? That's your imagination. You see things, you think in pictures. If I, if I say an apple, everybody think of an apple. You aren't seeing A-P-P-L-E. You see an apple, you have a picture. And some of you will picture a green apple or a red apple. And I could change your picture with words. Words paint pictures. And did you know what makes a person an effective communicator is if you can talk in a way that helps people to see what you're trying to describe. If all you're doing is just putting out facts and figures and if people can't see it, they'll lose it. Your memory functions off of an imagination. Uh, let me just start with this verse over in, uh, I think it's First Chronicles chapter 29 and I'll show you this from scripture. In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 18. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. This is David. He uh, was getting ready. He was close to dying and he called all of the nation together and they took up an offering to build the temple. And David gave of his own resources. He had already given like five point something billion dollars worth of gold and silver from the uh, treasuries of the nation. But out of his own personal bank account, he gave uh, one point something or two billion dollars worth of gold towards the temple. And when he did, the rest of the nation rose up and people were so touched by David giving that they started giving and all together they took up over a $5 billion offering. And they just began to start praising God. And he says, God, who are we? And he went back and recounted how they came out of Egypt and they used to be slaves. And who are we to give such a generous offering? All we did was take the blessing that you've already given unto us and given it back. And he was praising God that God had touched the people's hearts. And then he says, oh God, keep this forever in the imagination of their thoughts. What he's talking about is don't let them forget it. This is how you remember things. You can't remember anything you can't picture or imagine. I know I'm saying things that most of you haven't ever thought of. And so because of this, we don't use it. It's like this is something that functions in all of us, but you don't have a handle on it because you haven't understood it. If you can't understand it, you can't really use it. And um, most of us haven't effectively used an imagination, but this is how you remember things. I've used this example before that in Vietnam, we had water blivets. And this is how they brought our water to us. And most of you don't know what a water blivet is. You don't have a picture of it. And so because of it, I could say water blivet and most of you might remember it for a short period of time in your short term memory, but you won't remember it a year from now because you can't picture it. You don't know what it is, but I can use words to describe it. And they were, they were rubber 
uh, tubes, cylinders, and they had brass spigots on each end. A helicopter would bring them in. They came in 500 and 1,000 and 1,500 gallon sizes, and they'd bring in these big old water blivets and drop them off. We'd go get our water from them, and as you took the water out, the air would the atmospheric pressure would compress, compress them. And when they got empty, they'd just be totally flat and they'd come pick them up and carry them off. Now that may not present a perfect picture, but you know what? You've got a picture now and you'd be able to remember water blivet because you have something that you can see. You don't remember just information. This is why so much education doesn't work. Like for instance, mathematics, a good math teacher won't just say one plus one is two, two plus two is four and make you remember things. They will give you illustrations. They'll say, all right, I've got two apples here. And if I put two more with it, how many is that? And they'll give you something that you can picture. You know, this is really simple stuff, but I'm just saying this because an imagination. Some people think, well, imagination is for kids. You go to Disneyland and you imagine stuff. It's fantasies, what a lot of people think imagination is. But you use imagination every single day of your life. You couldn't get to and from work if you didn't have a picture of where the turns are and what it looks like. You couldn't make a grocery list without an imagination. You know what you do? You, set, you start and you go and you're familiar with your grocery store. And so you start down the whatever aisle, however you do it. And in your mind, you're walking down those aisles and thinking, what do I need? And you're looking at all of those things and thinking, do I need any of this and this? That's how you make a grocery list. Jamie and I went into England and in England, they think differently. They do things differently. And we went to the side of the store where in the States, they group certain foods together. In England, they don't do it the same way. And it took us, what, 30 minutes to find a bottle of water because they didn't put it with the sodas or with uh, whatever. They group it differently. And because of that, we had it pictured that it would be over here with these things and it was in a different place. You just don't realize how much you use an imagination, but you use it all of the time. You can't build anything without an imagination. That's why when they give you instructions, they will sit there and they'll tell you what to do, but then they'll have figure one and they'll show you a picture because a picture is worth a thousand words. You can get things by pictures that you can't get by just words. Words paint pictures. And we've learned in dealing with our offices and other places that you know what, when we really are having a problem and we've got to get something solved, you have to go look at a person and talk to them because like 70% of communication is nonverbal. I've been picking up on this. I remember we were watching some show and I just watched a person and I mean, their eyes changed ever so slightly. They just kind of squint and it communicated. It, they said volumes without saying a word. And I was looking at that and thinking, it is amazing how much we perceive by sight and stuff that we don't even realize. But a lot of communication is nonverbal. So anyway, you use your imagination. This is not just fantasy and for kids. It, you use it every moment of every day. You do it all of the time. And the sad thing is, if you don't realize what you're doing and realize how important it is, you will let your imagination be turned against you to where all you see is negative things. Remember that the definition is something not real or present. Every example I've used is talking about something that isn't present, but something that you've seen and you're recalling it to your memory. But when it comes to vision, when it comes to having God give you direction for your life, you have to use your imagination to see those things come to pass. You have to see it on the inside before you see it on the outside. You know, an example of this, before I get right into some scriptures on it, an example is that I, I heard a tape one time and this uh, pastor's wife had very poor eyesight. She had glasses that were so thick, they looked like the bottom of a Coke bottle. She was legally blind and she had had lots of people pray for her and she'd been disappointed so many times she didn't let people pray for her anymore. And they were having a healing evangelist come to her church and she didn't want this guy to pray for her because she didn't want to be disappointed again. So she avoided him. And finally he trapped her 
And he says, I am going to pray for you. And so he made her take her glasses off. And then he laid hands on her and prayed for her. And when he got through, he says, now, can you see? So this woman started to open her eyes and look. And he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes like, what are you doing? And he said, now, can you see? So she started to open her eyes again. And he said, shut your eyes. And she shut her eyes. Wondering, how am I going to tell if I can see if I don't open my eyes? And so he said the third time, he says, now can you see? So she started to open her eyes and he says, I didn't tell you to open your eyes. You've got to see yourself seeing before you can see. Can you see yourself seeing? Can you see yourself healed? So finally, this woman understood what he was talking about and she just kept her eyes closed, began to pray in the spirit. And after a few minutes, she says, I can see it. I'm healed. And he says, now open your eyes. And she opened her eyes and she could see. And you know, we don't use that as much as we should. Many people will come and ask me, would you please pray for me? But they've never seen themselves healed. Matter of fact, one of the biggest problems, I told a couple of people here tonight who have been sick for a very long period of time. I said, getting healed is not that hard. But what's hard is when you've been sick for a long, long time and you see yourself sick you dream sick, you think sick, you plan your day around the pains and about the things that you can't do and you have seen yourself sick. That's when it's hard to get a person healed. That's the reason that Jesus asked in Mark the ninth chapter, how long has it been since this boy was demon possessed? And it's not because he couldn't deal with it. He was dealing with the father and saying, you know, how long has it been? Because when something's been there a long time, you tend to see yourself that way. You have to change that image on the inside. Before I started seeing great miracles happen and people raised from the dead, I took John chapter 14, verse 12, that says Jesus was speaking and he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. And I took that passage of scripture and I began to meditate on it. And then I turned to every example where Jesus healed somebody, specifically raised people from the dead. And I began to study it and I would sit there and read it and get all of the information. And then I'd close my Bible and close my eyes and I would see myself raising Lazarus from the dead. I saw myself raising the child at the city of Nain from the dead. I saw myself raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. Everything Jesus did, I saw it. I, I sat there and pictured what it would be like to stand at the tomb and say, take away the stone and then yell with a loud voice. I saw it. And this is how I studied the word. And I did that for a long period of time. And it got to where at night I would dream 20 and 30 times a night that I was raising people from the dead. You know what that is? That's your imagination. And as soon as I started doing that, boom, I saw a person raised from the dead. And then I went over 10 years, never saw a person raised from the dead. And I just realized that, you know what? I did it one time. I can do it again. And I started taking those exact same things. I started dreaming that I was going to see people raised from the dead. And praise God, my son who's with us here got raised from the dead after being dead for five hours. And there is a connection between all of these things. Andrew's complete teaching titled, Don't Limit God Times 10, was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD. Or if you prefer, you can get the DVD as seen on TV. Each is available for a gift of any amount. Every album will also include the Don't Limit God sticker. This reversible static decal will cling to your window or mirror, reminding you not to limit God with small thinking. Remember to specify CD, DVD, or DVD as seen on TV when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awmi.net and click on Today's TV Offer to see all the ways you can get this teaching. The fifth audio teaching in today's series is titled, Godly Imagination. It's available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth CD free of charge. 
You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. Helpline hours are Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. until 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at awmi.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. We'd like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. Mark your calendars to come meet Andrew at one of these events. In the month of September, he'll be in Charlotte, North Carolina, Johnson City, Tennessee, and in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And in October, he'll be in Walsall, England, Victor Harbor, South Australia, Melbourne, Victoria, Australia, and in Carrara, Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. For more details on Andrew's next meeting in your area, visit our website at awmi.net. What do you do when one of your children is diagnosed with stage 4 cancer? Mike and Esther Mullins had a choice to make. To accept the virtual death sentence for their son and beg God for a miracle. Or to take a stand and act on the revelation that God wants you well. Take a healing journey with the Mullins family. Healing Journeys Volume 4. Now available on DVD at awmi.net. If you are a full-time minister, I'd like to invite you to join me on September the 30th through October the 4th as we have our Ministers Conference right here in Colorado Springs. This is always a highlight of the year. We have Bob Nichols, pastor of Calvary Cathedral in Fort Worth. Also, Bob Yandian from Tulsa, Oklahoma are always with me and we minister. I tell you, it's going to be a great time. It's just a special time for ministers. Plus, our building is nearly going to be complete. You'll be able to go visit that up at the sanctuary in Woodland Park. Remember that the dates are September the 30th through October the 4th right here in Colorado Springs. You do not have to motivate God to heal. God wants to heal more than you want to be healed. The almost too good to be true news you can use. www.awmi.net. Amazing.